Well, hello family, it is Miss Dana Ashley. Today I wanna to offer you a solution that will help you with any challenge you may be facing in your life, and I mean any, and I know that is a bold statement. I wanna offer you a breakthrough solution for the largest of problems. This is your nuke in the spiritual war that we are all facing. This is one of the most powerful weapons that we may have. The majority of churches are not teaching it, much less doing it. Churches are full of adultery, addictions, possession, unforgiveness, strife, and division. In other words, churches look a lot like everybody else. They have been infiltrated and watered down so that they do not have the proper tools to remove these obstacles from our lives and to protect ourselves and our loved ones. This can help you overcome challenges over your life that even constant prayer cannot do. So are you ready for a breakthrough for real change? Good. First, I'd like to show you a few examples of the kind of miracles that this method can bring. And when we get back, I'll show you amazing facts about this method that you probably didn't know. And most of all, that it's not nearly as difficult as you think. You may have problems in your life that just don't get better. I mean, you may have joined a prayer circle, you may have prayed, you may have joined a drum circle, I don't know, you may have done anything, but they just don't get better and you don't know what to do. And I'm here to tell you that there's something else you can do. And it's called not eating. Some people call it fasting, but if you not eat, if you do not eat and you let God work, something different happens. I know because it happened to me. I had lots of problems, man, I'll tell you about them. But God cured me, healed me, fixed me of so many things that I thought I'd never get healed from. It's something about not eating opens you up to a power of God in your life that's so amazing that I'm willing to go on YouTube about it. God really delivered me from a sexual addiction. I was addicted to pornography um, and that started as a young man and after getting saved in 1979 I thought that it would immediately go away but it didn't. So then I went to the ministry in 1982 and it just continued. And uh, I remember just praying and crying out to God and uh, I actually opened up and shared with a worldwide known minister in 1984 and I asked him, I said, you know, can you help me? I know you can. I know the Word of God says that you, you can pray for me and I believe I'll be, you know, set free and he prayed for me and nothing happened. So it was nine months later that I went on a four-day fast. I was in a man's condominium and on this fourth day of that fast, I was completely delivered from that sexual addiction. As wives, we are fasting for ourselves and we are also fasting for our husbands because we are one with our husbands. And as we fast, you may be desperate in your marriage. You may be desperate for your husband to change so that your marriage will improve. You may be waiting for him to hear from God and that is a wonderful reason to fast. But I want you to humble yourself even more than that and say to God, give my husband a new wife and let it be me. And in this fast, Lord, I humble myself to hear from you what it is that is in the way of me being the best wife that my husband needs. My name's Joe. Today is actually my 221st day of being clean and sober. I just wanted to create this video to share a little bit about my testimony and what, what it was like on my 40 day fast. I was a drug addict for 22 years straight. Started doing drugs when I was 16 with marijuana, and then I started experimenting with various other drugs that I never thought I'd ever try. Cocaine, mushrooms, LSD, ecstasy, and then the last two years, I had a really bad addiction to prescription pain pills. I want you guys to understand just how big the miracle that the Lord worked in my life through fasting. Not only did the Lord prove to me that I could go without food for 40 days straight, He also proved to me that I could go without drugs at the same time. I was a slave, I was a slave to drugs. While I was going through this fasting process, God showed me so much love and peace and joy and understanding and forgiveness that it changed my whole world around. I've never did a 24 hour fast like that before. The type of fast that it was, was a dry fast. So there was no water, there was no food. So God moves, he, he responds to the sacrifices that we make to get closer to him. What happened was God put a word in my spirit. It was something that I've been asking him for for a long, long time. And he said, it's mine. 
then as I was praising him for that, he gave me another word. He told me, he, he showed me where he was going to take me. And then I started breaking down, crying under the spirit of the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about weeping. I'm talking about thanking God for who he is and the mercy that he shows on us. Glory be to your name, O oh God. As I began to sit down and write out my thoughts about fasting, I realized very quickly that every significant spiritual breakthrough I have ever had was preceded by a fast. Now granted, I am a little new at this, but there's something that I've noticed about most of the believers that I come into contact with. And, <laughs> and that is there are two ways that I can quickly clear the room of believers. One is I could say, hey, does anybody want to study Revelation with me? And two, I could say, hey, does anybody want to go on a fast with me? I mean, it's just, it's happened again and again. I don't know what the deal is, but there's just something about those two things, two things that I love greatly, that seem to just not be something that most people are willing to talk about at all. And that's even though that most believers vaguely know, at least, of the benefits of fasting. But they think it isn't necessary or that it doesn't apply to them. Most of all, I think most people believe that it's absolutely impossible and that they will die without a day of food. Well, I'm here to let you know that these are complete lies and they are absolutely keeping you from your greatest spiritual potential if you're believing them. And now it could be that you have already been tapped to fast by spirit and you have talked yourself out of it because the thought of it seems completely impossible. Well, this video is for you. As you know by now, the world tells you lots of lies. And one of the lies that they will tell you is that not eating food is unhealthy and that your body cannot survive. So today I'm gonna show you that it is not only possible, but that your body was actually created too fast. The benefits of doing so are so incredible that it's absolutely astonishing. First of all, I've been wanting to share this with you for many reasons, but the main one being because of what I have and many others have been shown is coming to this earth. You will have in this lifetime, I mean, assuming you're not 80 already, you're going to face a time when you're going to be without food. And yes, even here in America, Babylon, especially. And our being spoiled and thinking that we need three meals a day is making us weaker, not stronger. And it will be part of why we fall so very hard. Think about it. Even the homeless in, I mean, I lived in LA, even the homeless in LA got two meals a day through the different programs that are there. Hardly anyone goes without food daily. So what will happen when people do not have food is that psychologically, they're gonna flip out. So when you already have a couple fasts under your belt and you understand the power in it and that you can not only survive but thrive during fasting, you will be able to remain calm in the face of not having food which will give you a huge psychological and physical advantage. Now, the reason why I speak with so much conviction about this in particular is because I actually have a lot of experience with fasting. Now, for several years I have fasted, but in my case it was for health reasons, which isn't really the point of this video, but I do want to go into the health benefits of fasting so that you psychologically can and mentally can understand that that part is no excuse. Once you understand how the body works and you get excited about fasting, then you can more easily embrace it for the real reason that we should be doing it, which is spiritual connection. To give a little background about how I was led into this personally, I was led into fasting for health reasons because I was dealing with breakouts for eight years uh, through my 20s. And I was lethargic, I didn't have much energy in the afternoon especially, and I was just generally not in my best health. But these breakouts would wind up being a blessing because it sort of forged me on this path of learning a lot about health. And I became sort of a guinea pig to myself. I tried so many things with diet and topical things, and none of these things helped my acne. But once I got into, once I fasted, everything changed for me. Well, first of all, even before I was a believer, I felt like I was being guided to fast, and I totally could feel the guidance pushing me in that way, but I was totally opposed to it. I thought, no way. There is no way I can go without food. I have kind of a, a high metabolism. So at night when I try to sleep, 
Um, if I have no food in my stomach, my stomach is churning and I literally can't fall asleep. So a lot of times I'll just come and get a bite of food to have something in my stomach so that I can fall asleep. And I didn't have a lot of weight to lose or anything like that, so I was just convinced that there is no way that I could ever, ever fast. Well, even though I kept getting these these promptings to fast, I kept ignoring it. And then not long after that, I wound up getting food poisoning. And there's a fast for you right there. That happens really quick. And so through that food poisoning, I thought, well, um, I'm certainly not gonna eat the, these two days, but then I just kept it going after that. And I was shocked at how easy it was to do that. So that gave me the courage to try it again a little bit later from the beginning. And during that fast, I implemented some other detox methods. And after that, I never broke out again. So this worked so well in my life and it caused so many other benefits that to things I didn't like little aches and pains that I didn't even know that I had until they were gone that I became a huge proponent for fasting. And I used to go around and tell, I'm kind of like that. I talk to people about what I'm excited about. And so I would go around and I would talk to everyone that was willing to listen or seem mildly curious about the benefits of fasting. Well, that actually led me into becoming a detox cleansing coach for several people. So through being this detox cleansing coach, I got to see a lot of people clear out a lot of things besides weight, which is obvious, and um, health and vitality. People cleared up um, pains in their body, um, skin issues, snoring, digestive issues, all kinds of health benefits came from these fast and detox protocols that I was uh, teaching them. But one thing that I wanna kinda go into that for me I think is it's really exciting for people to think about this because most of us know that we're not eating so great. I mean, I mean, there's the standard American diet, right? So lots of processed food, fast food, soda full of high fructose corn syrup and all these kinds of things. People are doing that and they know better. I mean, there's just, it's, it's you can't ignore, it's everywhere telling you that it's bad, but people do it anyway. Why? Because they're addicted. They're addicted to sugar and it's just very convenient in these diets. And so one thing that I think is a really important um, point on the health aspect of fasting is that, you know, when you crave bad things, it's because you're kind of full of bad things and your digestion is really bogged down with it. Your liver is full of toxins uh, as a result of eating it all the time. And so what happens when you fast is that you actually reboot your taste buds. You sort of come out on the other end and before when you're like forcing yourself to not go get that ice cream, afterwards you don't want that ice cream. So before you have to really use a lot of willpower to make different choices, but after you fast, that is like cleared away. It's like the gunk is cleaned off and you are in a different state of what you want to eat. And that's sort of like exercise. Once you exercise for a while, your body begins to crave it. Same thing applies to fasting. I think that's very encouraging for people because I mean, I personally don't like to eat use a lot of willpower to say no to food. I just like to want to have what I want, but I wanted my cravings to be different, and that is exactly what fasting can do for you. Now, a couple of notes about what will happen to you while you're fasting. Um, again, this is the health aspect. We'll get into spiritual in a little bit. When you're fasting, you, would, you may be very shocked at how much energy that you have. I was totally shocked by this. I felt like a hummingbird. I mean, I literally, I didn't need as much sleep. My mind was very like on point and I was even being quite active um, during my fast. Now, most of my fasts have involved doing um, water and juices, um, but no food, no food at all. And so the reason why this is, is very important to know. When you fast, your digestion actually shuts down. So this huge system, and it takes half of the calories that you consume are burned in the actual running of the system of digestion. That's a huge amount of calories. And so once that shuts down, your body is so incredibly intelligent. And so your body it conserves all of that energy that was running the system before and it begins to scavenge the entire body to figure out what can it break down and use that the body doesn't need, which is be a beautiful thing. 
and this is not just me saying this, um, but at this point, there are scientific, there's scientific studies coming out and proving it. For example, I'll just read this for a second. Dr. Walter Longo, professor of gerontology and the biological sciences of USC, stated that fasting gives the immune system the okay for stem cells to go ahead and begin proliferating and rebuilding the entire system. He says that the body gets rid of the parts of the system that might be damaged and or inefficient. So we're seeing the activity of the stem cells happen as a result of fasting, which if you've done any kind of research into stem cells, you should know that is very, very exciting. And even though fasting diets have been criticized by nutritionalists and the rest of the world as being unhealthy, this research suggests that starving the body kickstarts these stem cells into producing new white blood cells, which fight off infection. Now let's think about this. What happens to an animal when they're sick? They automatically stop eating. And we as humans freak out when our kids don't want to eat and we force feed them food. But I'm telling you, the body is amazing and highly intelligent and assuming they're keeping liquids down, which you definitely need that, the body needs to shut this digestive down so that it can go in and it can rebuild and bolster your immune system in a, in a way that you didn't even have before that you were sick. So of course, God made our bodies to be amazing, and this is just one of the ways that he did it. And another thing that happens during fasting that I found incredibly inspiring was that when you fast, you actually stimulate the production of human growth hormone. Now, if you don't know about human growth hormone, you may want to check it out um, in regards to sort of this like fountain of life and youth kind of thing. When we are, um, I think it's around 18, we have the highest amount of human growth hormone in our bodies. And from there, it just goes downhill. And so when you fast, you actually cause these spikes of human growth hormone in the body. Now, what does human growth hormone do? Such things as giving you a higher density of muscle and a lower density of fat. It gives you better skin, better hair. It gives you, you know, higher libido. It heals your wounds faster. It makes you to where you need less sleep and have more energy. Who can complain about any of those things? And now there are even doctors who are admitting that uh, patients that are undergoing chemotherapy who fast do better than patients who do chemotherapy alone without fasting. And that, that kind of blew my mind that they would even <laughs> admit that. But I can list in the description box links to those studies as well. Our bodies are amazing and they are made to fast. I mean, it makes perfect sense. If we in our past have not had access to food regularly, which is absolutely the truth. We haven't always had these fridges with food in them and, you know, a McDonald's on the corner that you go drive through, things like that. This is a relatively new thing. And so whenever we are without food, it makes sense that we have built-in mechanisms to improve ourselves during that time. So this is all really exciting. Most people don't realize this. And I also believe it's part of the reason why we're all so sick today because we never give our bodies a break. It's sort of like using your computer for a year straight without rebooting it. It just isn't made to do that. And now that we've broken down some of the myths around fasting, I want to segue into some of the more spiritual reasons that I'd like you to consider. So if Jesus had a constitution, where would it be? I like to think of the Beatitudes and his Sermon on the Mount of Olives as being where he really gets into the ways of being that we should all pay attention to and follow. In that sermon, there were three things that were so essential to a spiritual life and following his way that he didn't command people to do them. He presumed that they already were. And these were when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. And so instead of saying, you must give, he said, when you give, don't just do it so, he was warning people not to just do it so that everyone sees you. You know, he was talking to the hypocrites, and that was his biggest beef, was with people who were pretending to be spiritual but were not. So a lot of these warnings were around hypo hypocrisy. But so he said, when you give, he said, when you pray, and again, it's not a question of if, but when, in secret and not for show, to pray with intent and to not pray with empty words. And he gave us our Father as an example to follow. 
And then he said, when you fast, remember he said, do not look somber or disfigure your face so that you obviously are fasting. Because in that time, a lot of people fasted. And so he said, you know, wash your face and anoint your head with oil and do not do it to be obvious to others. So a lot of these Pharisees were wanting to appear to be spiritual, but it wasn't in their heart. They were not doing it for the right purposes. I found it interesting also because uh, remember when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, that's interesting because that is what he said to rebuke the devil. When? Right after he had fasted. He had the spiritual strength to be able to rebuke the devil because he had been fasting as the Spirit had led him to do. It also has been said that fasting detaches you from this world and prayer reattaches you to the next world. So I, I think that's incredibly accurate because through fasting, we are able to loosen the things of this world that we know that we shouldn't be doing in the first place. So if Jesus assumed that his followers would be fasting, Shouldn't we consider it mandatory too? I mean, ultimately, fasting is the total humbling of yourself before the Lord. You are putting your spiritual needs before even your physical needs, and this does not go unnoticed. Most of us know that Jesus fasted for the 40 days, but Moses did as well. Now, on, um, I want to give a couple notes about what fasting is not because I think that there is some confusion around what qualifies as fasting. I noticed a lot of people on, you know, on YouTube and elsewhere, I had a brother talk to me about this, said he was doing the Daniel fast. And I was like, Daniel fast? And he's like, oh, you know, whenever they did away with the wine and meat. And um, I mean, I looked at scripture and nowhere in there does it call it a fast at all. In fact, it is, it is not accurate to call um, doing away with um, alcohol and meat, a fast. Um, if you want to say you're altering your diet and uh, as a sacrifice, wonderful, but that's not a fast. Um, let's just be clear about it. And, and as a note on the Daniel fast that I also think is important to, sh to share with people, um, part of the incredible freedom that comes with fasting is that you actually are not having to think about food. You'd be surprised when you do this how, what kind of relationship you have with food, and also how much of your time and energy is spent managing getting food and, you know, cooking food and buying food and all this kind of stuff. It's really much more time consuming than you can realize. And if you're doing the Daniel fast, it's actually more difficult than fasting. I, I believe, um, even from a physical level, when you're still eating food, your digestion is still running. And so you're hungry but you're not eating the things you really want to eat. So you're not getting all those benefits that I was telling you earlier about your digestion shutting down, your immune system being bolstered, the stem cells, the human growth hormone, all that's not happening while you're doing the Daniel fast. And further, you're sort of more in the world because you are, okay, I got to eat a vegetarian meal. Where's a recipe? How am I going to do this? It's, it's a lot more distracting than you would imagine. And so the Daniel fast Truly, it, it is not a fast. I'm not saying it's not healthy for you to do that for some time, and it can't be sort of a sacrifice, but it's just not fasting. The thing about the fasting that I think is most important for all of us to, to really grasp is that this is all about like, like humility, right? So you're letting your creator know that you are willing to release yourself from this world and put him first. Remember, if you love this world, you will lose it. If you hate this world, you will gain it. So, so there is a huge spiritual declaration whenever you are saying, I am willing to lay this down for you, Lord. Now, so if you understand that the two main drives of the people on this earth are sex and food, and you're willing to let go of food to seek him, he is going to listen. In Isaiah 58, um, it, it is reiterated about like, how you are to be humble and to, to fast and come to the Lord. It talks about, um, it's not just about giving up food and that it warns us against going through the motions of humility. Now, there are plenty of religions that are going through the motions of humility, right? But it's all about our heart. 
we're laying this down and we are saying, Lord, I seek you. I seek your face. I seek your heart. I seek your will for me. This is not giving the Lord an ultimatum about what he needs to do for you. It is saying, I'm laying it all down for you. It is crucifying the flesh in the most real way. So just like Jesus was really hard on the hypocrites for pretending to be holy through these different methods, we don't want to pretend to be humble. Um, we, are, we are truly seeking his face and we are truly humbling ourselves in a way that, that if we're doing it right, we'll be shown things about ourselves that will shock us and that will automatically bring us into a state of humility. <laughs> you know, we talked about how whenever you're convicted, um, when he showed me some things that I was doing before that I thought were perfectly fine, and I saw through his eyes like what I was really doing, your heart is just like humbled and you don't have to fake it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And James 4.10 also reflects this. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So when you're truly humbling yourselves, that's when he's going to raise you up and show you things that he never showed you before. One of the reasons why I think none of us should really consider fasting optional in our spiritual life is due to something that happened in Matthew that I want to point out here really quickly. Let me just read this. Up. So in Matthew 17, around 17, 20, the disciples were um, trying to heal a little boy who had been demon possessed and they were not able to do so. And so the father of the little boy brought the son to Jesus and asked him if he could heal him because his disciples couldn't. And Jesus had some pretty harsh words about that. He said, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Whoa. So then um, he rebuked the demon and it immediately came out. And uh, the boy was healed. Now the disciples were so impressed by this that they took Jesus aside and they said, why did it not come out for us? And he goes into this bit about having faith. Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say into this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So here's something very interesting about this flower Bible that everybody was giving me a hard time about. And, you know, I bought this when I didn't have, you know, I didn't know enough. I just bought a Bible because I was so excited. It was my first Bible. And let me tell you, Lord can show you stuff in any Bible, okay? So... Don't let anybody tell you that your Bible is absolutely no good because guess what? God can show you things in the birds, in the flowers, in a piece of cabbage. He can show you everywhere. But that said, I do want to give a warning about this Bible because people have, have talked about the Catholic ties to the NIV. And I saw yesterday that this scripture was removed, which was really important. So after it talks about um, having the faith to, to heal, it then says, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So he let them know because they had not fasted that they did not have the spiritual power in order to move that demon. And this Bible does not have that in there. And so, although, yes, God can show you truth everywhere, you do need to understand that you should look at different versions of the Bible. A lot of people love King James. I've seen some things in there that I don't agree with also, but long story short, the NIV is, is really wrong to leave that out, and that should be an indicator to you of how powerful it is. So what other things are we not able to move in our lives because we're not fasting? This is a very good question and something that we should all be thinking about. Now in Isaiah 58, there's a section actually called True Fasting, and I think it's really important because it's, again, talking about that um, false humility that you do not want to have, but it also contains a very important key around the kind of fast that God will not honor. In Isaiah 58, 3, and the Lord is saying, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please, and you exploit all your workers, and your fasting ends in quarreling and strife. He's, he's getting onto them for being in their pride and being in their ego and suppressing other people and hurting other people. We can't be in that kind of place in our heart when we're meant to be humbling ourselves before our God. And he talks about when what kind of fast he does want to see, 
is he says to share your food with the needy, to provide shelter for others. Um, when you see the naked, to clothe them and to not turn from them and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood. And so there's definitely like humbling of the heart that is a key part of this fasting process as well. And that actually reminds me of something that I saw in Joel that was really mind blowing because um, if you look at Joel, um, it's a little tiny book, but it's really um, powerful because it actually is a little window of the end times, but it is giving you a major key as to what we are to do in the times of tribulation. And let's look up Joel. Joel, 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 Joel. Where are you, Joel? In Joel, um, it's sort of like a little window into... Uh, what I believe is Revelation 9. So during the, the trumpets, and we know there are seven trumpets, and at the fifth trumpet, it describes in Revelation the invasion of the locust and the army that is um, coming as a result of that invasion. Now, also in Joel, it talks about this invasion of the locusts. And it is also mentioned that this is the time right before the coming of the Lord. And when we know that the Lord comes on the last trump, um, and this is the fifth trump, it is the time of great duress and strife and crazy things are going down. And in the middle of Joel, I found it incredibly phenomenal because you can see that it's reiterating the same things that are in Revelation when it says, in the day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes such as never was in, a in ancient times nor never will in, in times to come. So this is definitely pointing to a future event that is like the end event. It is the seven, It is the fifth trumpet and it says in, Rev in Joel 2.10, before them the earth shakes, the heavens tremble, and the sun and moon are darkened, and the stars no longer shine. Now that is also something that you hear Jesus say in Matthew 24, is it not? When he talks about what must happen before the coming of the Son of Man. And just like the same thing in Joel, it says, a Joel to lower part of 11, the day of the Lord is great, it is dreadful, who can endure it? It is talking about what is happening right before the day of the Lord. Now, that's the next line is the key, and it says, Joel 2, 12, even now, meaning in the face of all this crazy tribulation, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Okay, so he's calling for people in the middle of tribulation to come to him in weeping and mourning and what? Fasting. And it tells you what he does when you do. It goes on to elaborate that he will answer them. He tells them that he will provide for him. I'll, I'm sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Okay. He goes on to say the threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. That's 24. You will have plenty to eat until you are full. That's 26. So he's saying when you come to me in fasting and mourning and you, you're humbling yourself to me in the face of strife, I will provide for you. And then we all know about Acts 2.17, you know, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Well, Joel has the same thing that says it's a parallel scripture to Acts 2.17 on, on Joel 2.28. I will pour my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even my servants, both men and women, I will pour my spirit on those days. So he's also saying, I'll give you the gift of prophecy. He's telling you what he will give us for this humbling of ourselves, this mourning and weeping before God, where we fast and we pray and we call out to him. So I find this to be like, for me, this is the key to the whole book of Joel. He is calling you even to the end to do this. So why not do it now? Why not do it before we're dealing with the invasion of the locusts and things being really, really crazy? It is never too late for that. However, I would say by doing it now, you are preparing yourself to be ready to face the situation of not having food. You will be closer to him so that you'll know where you're even meant to be in these times. And I hope that this video is inspiring you that you can do it. I really, really pray then hope that, that somebody out there gets something from this video and that they're able to 
to take that plunge and to take a fast to draw near to your creator. Miracles can happen with this. I'm going to wrap the video up with a little bit more of testimonials and things like that. But for now, I will say God bless you. Thank you so much for watching and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. You see, my whole life, I search for peace, love, understanding, grace, forgiveness from people, you know, friends, girlfriends, from drugs, from, from family members, and I couldn't find it. <laughs> not, even, not even my own mother could give me that. And I've walked in that freedom, and I'm free today. And um, I asked God later, I said, Lord, why is it when I opened up with that man in 1984, why is it that I didn't get delivered? Or when I went to that man, I was concerned that that pornography addiction would keep me from the ministry that I knew I was called to. So the focus of my sorrow was myself. If you look at 2 Corinthians and the, uh, the 10th chapter, Paul said, godly sorrow leads to repentance. But he said, worldly sorrow leads to death or further bondage. Well, worldly sorrow is when the focus of your sorrow is, what's going to happen to me? What will my sin cost me? Will I be judged? The whole focus is me. Godly sorrow, the focus is on Him. I've hurt the heart of the one I love. So, when I opened up with that national, international known minister, the focus was you. He said, when you went on the fast, he said, the complete total focus was, God, I am so fed up with hurting the heart, your heart, the heart of the one I love. The one rock that I forgot, that I neglected to really give a chance was, was Jesus. I, I had to be high to get out of bed. I had to be high to, to go to the store. I had to be high to take a shower. I mean, it was bad. My 40 day fast was like a roller coaster. He would build me up and then the next day he would, he would break me down and then he would build me up and then break me down. All the while, I was learning more and more about not just who he is, but who, who I am. God didn't create you. He didn't set you forth in this world for you to come into this world and just be stressed out and struggle your whole life. God has a plan for you. He has a dream for your life. But the only way you can accomplish your dreams is if you hear his voice. See, what fasting does, it makes you super sensitive to the voice of God's spirit. Your spirit now is sensitive to hear, hear his voice and you are more likely to hear accurately what God's telling you to do when you fast. When I went through my fast and the Lord revealed to me who he is in a very, very personal way, that's what made everything click. Sundays, I went with no food, no water, no juice, no nothing. And then Monday through Saturday, I had water and juice and I did that for 40 days. Now, that doesn't mean that you should do that. You need to talk to Jesus and figure out a plan for your life. By fasting, not only are you going to deny your flesh and weaken your flesh, by weakening our flesh, we strengthen our spirit. God made me realize how much He loves me, how much He cares for me, how much He's there for me, and how much I can trust Him. I want to ask you something. Do you need God's protection on your children? Do you need wisdom and favor and healing? Do you need help with an overwhelming problem? Are you dealing with unhealthy habits that are destroying your life and your health? Are you facing circumstances that feel too big for you? Then it's time for you to fast. You don't have to be addicted to alcohol. You don't have to be addicted to nicotine. You don't have to be addicted to pornography. You don't have to live that life of being in bad habits the rest of your life. If you will fast about it, God says, I will break that yoke off of your neck. Somebody give God praise. It's happening even as I'm speaking. Come on and praise Him for freedom. Them. Come on and praise him because there's no yoke that Satan has put on you or your family that's going to be on it 21 days from now. In Jesus' name.